Okay, just to let you know, uh, the sun has set. I'm filming after dark, and I'm actually filming this in the Malay world right now. Um, and after dark in the Malay world... <sighs> Tell you about that in a second. Um, but where are we? We're looking at um, Srivijaya. Okay, so historians say that there was a kingdom that existed from roughly the 7th to 14th centuries AD. Its capital was located on the island of Sumatra um, in the area of what is today Palembang. So when we say kingdom and we're talking about an early polity like Srivijaya, um, generally that doesn't that means we're not talking about a place with like clearly defined borders and uh, and things like that. Instead, um, these early kingdoms, really anywhere in the world, were basically centers or capitals that had um, you know decreasing amounts of power and influence as you got further away from the capital. So in the case of Srivijaya, there was a ruler, um, and that ruler probably relied on princes and uh, members of the nobility to rule over areas around the capital. But then in areas further afield, um, Srivijaya appears to have had tributary relations with small little rulers in the region who offered, say, tributary goods um, in exchange for perhaps protection or prestige or titles or something like that. So even though Srivijaya wasn't really a kind of a, a, an, an empire in, our, in a kind of a, this, a territorial sense, it probably was in terms of relations that it had with various peoples in the region. And a key element in all of this was trade, as Srivijaya was perhaps a kind of hub um, from where you know uh, trade went out after these goods from the various tributary kingdoms all came in. So this is kind of guesswork because there's a lot that we don't know about Srivijaya. What we do know is that it was probably Buddhist or Hindu Buddhist or something like that, as it's clear that it had very good, um, you know, close cultural relations with the Indian world and visitors to Srivijaya reported uh, that it was a place of Buddhist learning. Um, at the same time, we also know that Srivijaya was a Malay kingdom because there are stone inscriptions from Srivijaya, not many but some, and um, in those stone inscriptions we can find Malay words, like the word Datu, a word for a ruler, which is a Malay term, it's also an Austronesian term, um, and the, the area that this uh, Datu ruled over is referred to as a Kadatuan, another term typical to say Malay and Austronesian for um, you know, describing this kind of area that was ruled over by this ruler. So it was a Malay kingdom, but at the same time, it had very uh, close relations with Indian culture, and those stone inscriptions are filled with Sanskrit terms. Um, and indeed, in the Malay language today, you can still find uh, terms from Sanskrit, like um, guru, teacher, or raja, king. Uh, what else we got here? Bahasa, language. Puasa, fasting. There's a whole bunch of words like that that are in Malay today, um, in no small part because of this early history when the Malay world was closely connected with, um, you know, uh, India. Um, so this place, Srivijaya, was um, a prosperous place. And when that happens, whenever you have a situation where, say, you're doing really well, chances are there's gonna be someone else out there somewhere who's gonna say, you know what, I want some of what that person's got. And that seems to be what happened in Srivijaya's case. 
Uh, we know that there were some conflicts with um, a kingdom from India, the Cholas, big, a big uh, kingdom on the neighboring island of Java got powerful and kind of started to push Srivijaya around. The result is that by the 14th century, Srivijaya started to lose its influence and it gradually faded from the historical record. Before all that happened, or maybe as it was happening, there was a member of the royal family from Srivijaya who left and who tried to find a new place to establish a base. The story goes that he headed off from Palambang and headed to Singapore. Uh, but for whatever reason, after scoping that place out, he didn't decide to stay there, and he headed up the Malay Peninsula to the area where um, we now have the city of Malacca. Now, Malacca is a very important place because it's located in a critical uh, geographic position. That waterway that goes between the Malay Peninsula and the island of Sumatra is known as the Straits of Malacca. And it is basically the number one uh, pathway through the region. So if you're going from uh, India or the Middle East and heading towards China, or if you're going from China and heading toward India and the Middle East, the Straits of Malacca is the place that you want to go through. So in 1402, this member of the Sri Vijayan royal family established a base in Malacca, and that's basically like setting up a 7-Eleven or a convenience store on the superhighway of superhighways. I mean, everyone is gonna need to stop in to get some gas, buy a Slurpee, buy some chips, um, and you're gonna do great, great business. And that's exactly what happened with uh, Malacca as uh, merchants started to congregate there after it was established. So they did this because the location was great, uh, but also historians credit the founder of Malacca with a couple of uh, policies that he implemented or a couple changes that he implemented that also really facilitated the development of Malacca. This guy's name was, um, the hell was his name? Parama, Pramashvara? Is it Pramashvara? Crap. I told you you shouldn't film at night, you know? Let me see, wait, I got my phone here. Wikipedia, low battery, uh-oh. What did historians do before Wikipedia? Uh, here it is, I really have no idea. I was, I was, I was looking it up before doing this. Uh, here we go. Uh, but I knew it all anyway. Ooh, ah, Prameshvara, I knew it anyway, see? Uh, so, a very Indic name, Prameshvara, uh, not long after establishing Malacca in 1402, this guy, Pramashvara, converted to Islam and changed his name to Sultan Iskandar Shah. So in um, Southeast Asia, in the world in general, when we have a Muslim king, we usually don't call him a king, we call him a sultan. And then we don't call the kingdom a kingdom, we call it a sultanate. So in the early 1400s, uh, Malacca became a sultanate because the, sul the ruler converted to Islam and became a sultan. This transformation is something that historians think gave uh, Malacca another boost because in addition to its location, uh, now as a sultanate, it was a welcoming place for the uh, traders from the Muslim world, be it the Middle East or India, and indeed they congregated in Malacca and contributed to its prosperity. So that's one thing that this guy, um, Prameshvara, now Sultan Iskandar Shah did. Another thing he did was to establish diplomatic relations with China. Now, in the early 1400s, China was under the control of the Ming Dynasty. And um, yes, in establishing relations with China, this would have encouraged Chinese traders to go there. And it's these two things that historians say really helped Malacca, connections with the Muslim world and connections with China. In reality, though, those two worlds were not as divided as that dichotomy might make things sound. Uh, because in the early 1400s, the emperor of China was a guy by the name of Yongle. And Yongle came to power, what can we say, kinda 
illegitimate. Uh, he had some problems. Yeah, he had some legitimacy problems. And so he kind of tried to show off a bit to, you know, put people in their place because he knew he kind of got to the throne through the back door. And like, I think someone died and a palace burned and lots of bad stuff went down, you know? And so in any case, what happened is uh, one of the things he did was to send these big, massive voyages out into Southeast Asia and all the way to the eastern coast of Africa, basically as a way to say, I'm Yongle, I'm in power, I'm bad, I'm gonna mess you up. Wow. Um, he, nah, well, no, maybe he did. In any case, these voyages were basically a way for this guy Yongle to kind of show the world that he was in charge but the thing that's important for us is that the guy who led those voyages, or many of them, was an admiral, admiral, admiral by the name of Zheng He. Uh, and Zheng He was Muslim because there were Muslim communities in China at that time, and Zheng He was from one such community. What is more, some of the traders who came from China to trade in Southeast Asia were also Muslim because they came from Muslim communities in places like Fujian. So, uh, you know, Malacca, this first sultan, he created connections with the Muslim world, he created connections with China, and in reality, those two worlds were not as divided as we think they are. So I think all of this helped uh, Malacca's prosperity at that time, but there were people from all other places who congregated there as well. And like I said before, when you start doing something and you're doing, you know, things are going well, chances are there's gonna be someone out there who goes, I want some of what that guy's got. And that's exactly what happened with Malacca, and we'll look at that in the next movie.